Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontefract, who's in the house today. The one and only my pal, Ron Carucci. Ron has a 30-year track record helping executives tackle challenges of strategy, organization, and leadership from startups to Fortune 10, nonprofits to, yeah, heads of state. Turnarounds to new markets and strategies, overhauling leadership and culture to redesigning for growth. With experience in more than 25 countries on four continents, he helps organizations articulate strategies that lead to accelerated growth and then designs programs to execute those strategies. The best-selling author of eight books, including the Amazon number one, Rising to Power, and his recently released, To Be Honest, Lead with the Power of Truth, Justice, and Purpose. We're going to get into that today, Ron. Ron's a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, where Navalent's work, which he co-founded on leadership, was named one of 2016's management ideas that mattered most. He's also a regular contributor to Forbes, two-time TEDx speaker. Ron is also the proud member of the Marshall Goldsmith MG100 Coaches community. Ron, first and foremost, thank you so much. Uh, you're a dear friend. I've looked up to you for years. I know you moved from the Northwest to the East, but that's fine. I stay remained in the Northwest. What I love about uh, this gem, to be honest, now award-winning, I must say, uh, is that it's based, Ron, on this 15-year longitudinal study of more than 3,200 leaders about organizational honesty. And so, one of, I mean, amongst many things, you discovered um, that while trust is important, uh, it just doesn't happen. And you discovered, you know, the concepts uh, like reliability, uh, integrity seem to be table stakes at the trust table. So why don't we start there? Can you elaborate on these findings? First of all, is there truth in trust and what's what's going on at the truth table these days in the organization? Well, first, let me start by saying, Dan Pondrefrak, it's just uh, a a cornucopia of joy to be in your presence. And I look forward to it every time I get that privilege. So thanks for having me into the conversation today. Um, I would say that the findings are staggering when you think about the trust recession we are living in. Ooh, I like that term. <laughs> we are, it's, a, it's in a free fall everywhere you look. And leaders simply cannot afford to take for granted the fact that trust is not merely earned because you have a title, because you think you're trustworthy. And whenever I ask leaders the question, do your people trust you? They often respond with this incredulous look like, well, why wouldn't they trust me? And wrong question. The real question is, well, why should they? Mm. And when I ask for evidence to produce their confidence or to back up their confidence, I, I get a litany of good intentions. I get a litany of things like, <clears throat> well, I, I mean to treat them well, or I tell them the truth, or I don't pull my punches, or I, I work hard on their behalf, you know, all, all, all well-intended actions that have no, no basis in evidence. Um, and when I ask them the the question of, okay, well, if I were to talk to your people about how well they trust you, how confident are you in what they would say? And I get hope. Uh, I, I hope they'll tell you that. Uh, um, so clearly the, the gap between intent and impact maybe is likely far wider than most leaders think. And today to earn the trust of others, to be considered labeled honest, it's more than just telling the truth. What we learned in our research is that the definition of honesty is truth, justice, and purpose. You have to say the right thing, do the right thing, and say and do the right thing for the right reason. Uh, anything less is makes you a kind person, makes you well-intended, makes you, you know, good to work with. But if you want to be trustworthy, uh, the as people's experience of trustworthiness has gone into a free fall, their expectations have gone to the highest bar ever. And to meet that bar takes just a lot more than we ever thought. Mm -hmm. When you allude to uh, sort of a trust deficit and, in fact, you know, a trust recession, I'm always interested in the word trustworthy because when you flip it around, and I think of myself often in the shoes of the team member, is the leader worthy of trust, Ron, in this day and age? It's Well, it's certainly in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and so, sure, the leader can be worthy of trust, but you have to earn it every day. You don't, you don't arrive in a position, arrive at a certain level of accomplishment or a certain level of um, experience. And suddenly, you know, it's not, it's not like the Marriott Platinum Club where you get lifetime membership once you've stayed a million nights. It, it's, it's a renewable asset every single day. And if you're not earning it every day, you're taking for granted what that means. And of course, you know, if I have to explain to a leader, 
the the risks and consequences of losing your people's trust and that's unclear to you then we will have to talk about your career because you're obviously in the wrong job so the question has to has to be the harder deeper question dan of what does it mean to earn the trust and to be worthy of others trust you don't get to hold that yardstick mm. and today you have a workforce uh in a post-pandemic world i hope soon to be post-pandemic uh where the many of the scripts have flipped and the expectations of you as compassionate, empathic, curious, open-minded, vulnerable, uh, which used to be these highfalutin, lofty attributes after you were commanding and controlling and budgeting and directive and you know results-oriented and all the other things we've celebrated for too many decades. Yeah. Those things are now table stakes. And they're the first table stakes people look for. And so if you're still a jerk, you know, even if you're a well-intended jerk, um, you start in the red, you start distrusted. If you're a leader, if you're a peer of a set of people uh, that you've been peers with for years, we have the research tells us that when you rise to suddenly get promoted to be their boss, the meter gets reset. Mm -hmm. And you are now one of them and have to re-earn all the trust you think you had and you think you ascended with uh, that you don't. So it's a, it's a very rare but precious commodity but if you start your leadership journey of others without it, um, you might have in, at one day in history been able to muscle your way through, you know, purchasing or ordering the compliance of people uh, to get performance and results. That's, those days are long gone. Uh, we are in a workplace today where people's remit isn't how many t-shirts they printed or how many cases they closed or how many files they processed. Today, the remit you're asking for is their analysis, their creativity, mm -hmm. their ideas, their radical feedback, their honesty about your stupid strategy. Um, and if you forfeit that um, and you fail to recognize that the contribution and the contributor are fused, they are one today. And when you talk about that contribution, you are talking about the contributor. If you fail to do that in a way that earns trust with dignity, with respect, with care, um, you're pissing on all the performance you need from your team and squandering it. One of the things you point out several times, both in the book and other places you write and consult and you know, speak and everything else that you do in your repertoire of awesomeness uh, is uh, essentially attribution error where the leader believes that they are emitting a hell of a lot of trust. Uh, yet, however, in the research with employees and team members, they're like, uh, 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 actually, there's a big gap here. So what do you make of that attribution error? And, and again, what is it that we should be learning from that? Fabulous question, Dan. I think some of it's just hubris. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just good old fashioned, you know, uh, of course I'm trustworthy. But what leaders <laughs> so often fail to forget is trustworthiness is a currency. It's an economy. And it gets inflated, it gets deflated, like any currency does. And people trade in different currencies within the same economy. So you may be trading in a trustworthiness of competence, meaning I'm smart, I'm good at my job, therefore I earn your trust. But your people may be trading in a currency of character, mm -hmm. in a currency of relatability, or in a currency of um, personality. Uh, the yardsticks that are people holding up are holding up to you to measure your trustworthiness aren't simply the ones that you hold up to them. And if you fail to read the tea leaves and read the room uh, about what it is people are asking of you to earn your trust, and you've not asked the question of them, how do I earn your and, and keep your trust, um, and you're, then you're just flying without radar. Mm -hmm. And I think many leaders just assume that if I earn, if I give or withhold trust based on these criteria, those must be your criteria too. Um, and if not, they should be, uh, which of course is just a, a fool's errand. Mm. You, uh, you alluded to just a couple of seconds ago, actually, uh, dignity. And so how, how do you define dignity in the workplace? And, and why is that such an important and critical leadership trait uh, that I believe I think it's kind of lost these days? But just tell us your, your sense of it. You know, I think I don't think the pandemic caused this crisis of meaning that we're facing. Right. Mm. I think I've, I've, I've watched in your writing, you call it the great reset or the great, you know, you've, you've abolished, like I'm grateful many have, the great resignation as if it's some random phenomenon that just happened. I don't think the pandemic caused it. I think the pandemic revealed it. Uh, and I think people show up to work every day. This is the simplest leadership lesson I can give you. 
with two fundamental questions in their heart and mind looking to be answered. Do I matter and do I belong? Your job as a leader is simply to make sure they never wonder if the answer to those questions is yes. Mm. Do everything you can to make sure that they have to waste no capacity in the pursuit of those answers and can invest all their other capacity into producing the results and enjoying them that you need. Any shred of doubt they have about those questions is capacity removed from the work and capacity to pursuing meaning and belonging. And the problem is when they pers- when the question of do I matter gets gets forfeited, they invest themselves in the dangerous counterfeit need of looking like I matter. <laughs> and that's a dangerous game because now you have people playing games and performatively letting you know how important they are mm-hmm. and making themselves look indispensable by making sure emails are set to go out at three in the morning so they look like they've been up all night uh, and doing all the things that that trade in very false currencies of of, of value. So. If you are not treating people's contribution, which is the same as the contributor, with dignity, with honor, think about the, you know, the, the Latin derivative of the word honor is this. It's a, it's a gasp. It's this sense of <laughs> awe. It, and, and if you're not treating people's work in that way, e- even when they fall short, even when you have to tell them what they can improve, if you're not treating it with a sense of dignification of that work and you're just treating it like it was a due to you and be just another day at the office you are telling them you don't matter if you are uh, and here's a simple way to, to ask yourself this question whose voices do you listen to whose voices do you intentionally maybe unconsciously but in but somewhat intentionally not listen to who who who's in your kitchen cabinet who's um who, who gets to help you change your mind um, when do you never change your mind with whom? Are there people coming into your office on a regular basis telling you things that make you uncomfortable to hear? If the answer is nobody, then you be very confident your leadership sucks because, <laughs> right. they're telling, because they're telling somebody. You are the topic of conversation at dinner at night in their homes. If you don't know what stories they're telling, um, assume they're not dignifying ones. Mm. To uh, hit the nail on the head there, I, um, I laughed, not at you, but uh, with you and the situations that are playing out over and over again in our organizations. Um, when you switch to sort of the, the justice pillar, uh, when we flip it around, you know, you're pointing out that there's a lot of injustice mm-hmm. inside the organizations, which can be related to dignity, of course, but you've, you've actually resurrected the term um, moral injury. Uh, where, you know, that mistreatment, that kind of leadership incompetence, right, that kind of psychological, emotional, uh, mental safety issues of leaders inside the organization is causing some moral injury. So what is it and, and what can yeah. we do about it related to, to be honest? Thank you for asking that, uh, Dan. Um, you know, for years, we've misdiagnosed burnout. We've said that people are burning out in this pandemic. But what moral injury was first set, first research with military folks, right? You know, the, 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 the trauma response, our amygdala imprinting in our brains, a trauma response to the atrocities you see in war. Mm-hmm. We then expanded it over the pandemic, rightfully so, to the healthcare workers who were having to make life and death choices with impossible conditions and experiencing that trauma response as well. Well, it turns out all, you know, organized endeavor uh, can experience moral injury. You know, when you as a leader ask people to do things they're not equipped to do, that you have given them not, neither the resources or the time or ensure that they have the skill to be successful at. When you give impossible deadlines, when you play favorites, when you are hypocritical, when you ask, when you set one standard for others and live by another yourself, you create the trauma response of other people feeling helpless and watching you harm other people. Mm. And, and, and so our brains imprint that. Um, like a triggering response. And then we just keep looking for it over and over again, which means you're, you're, you're hindering performance, but you're also hindering people's certainty. You're, you're um, perpetuating people's certainty that, that in fact, they don't belong. And so uh, you, you don't have to look very far to find injustices in your organization. Here's a simple way to, t- to ask yourself, who are the organizational bullies um, around you? Who are the people you know demean others, um, uh, take advantage of others, exploit others, are passive aggressively threatening of others that coerce people, you know who they are. What have you done to protect your team from them? How have you stood up to them? Even if it's your boss's boss, I don't care. Mm -hmm. If you've ignored those bullies, um, you have perpetuated injustice. 
Who are the privileged roles in your company? You have them. If you're a tech company, let's talk about your engineers. If you're a high growth company, let's talk about your sales force. If you're a brand loyal company, let's talk about your marketers. There are privileged roles in your company, which in and of itself is not a problem because not all work is created equal. If you're a high growth company, I don't want you treating your accountants the same as your salespeople when it comes to the work. But when it comes to the people, they need to be all on the same playing field. And here's the way you know, if their privileges those roles have disadvantage somebody else in some way, that privileges become a problem. Mm. <clears throat> if you are not rooting out that unearned privilege uh, of, <clears throat> of that role, which should, only be, which should only privilege the work, not the person, you've unleveled the playing field. Can your people answer this question confidently? I am confident that no matter who I show up as, in what role, no matter what I look like or sound like or who I am, I have as much of a chance of being successful here as anybody else. Hmm. Would they go, well, if there's a pause, the answer is no, the playing field is not level, uh, which means you have perpetuated injustice. Um, here's the danger. What we know from the research is that when people feel wronged, they feel entitled to take. If people cannot, if your accountability processes that measure contribution are unlevel and unjust, you are four times more likely to have people be dishonest with you because you've told them that the only way for them to get their due is to embellish their accomplishments, hide their mistakes, and self-promote. Mm -hmm. um, and you've created, you made dignity and justice, justice a zero-sum commodity. So if I get more, you get less. And so you'll be damn sure I'll get my, my share of that. I don't care whose expense it becomes that. And so you've set up this cage fight uh, of people rather than making sure that dignity and justice are expandable pies. Um, and you have demonstrated with your leadership that you are going to see to it that no matter what it takes, your people will never wonder if they have a chance to be successful. So the, I guess the ignorance of the leader is creating these almost artificial uh, silos and classes, if you will. It is, it's a great word and it's very classist. Um, and, and unfortunately our HR systems perpetuate it, right? You have, how many, how, how many stratifications do we have just to make career paths look viable when they're not, you know, <laughs> senior director one, senior director two, senior director three, vice president A, vice president B, vice president three, vice president 38. I mean, we they just this ridiculously false um, pathing and then, and then pay bands that are stratified to the nth degree that just look foolish. And so, you know, it, 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 it may be ignorance, Dan, it may be willful blindness. Mm. Um, but whatever it is, if you're not actively on the hunt as part of your routine, part of your job, looking to root out injustices and letting your people see that you won't tolerate unfairness, um, then you're willfully turning a blind eye to some of them. It's, it's, oh. it's, 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 in, your, in your budget meetings, when you set your budgets, quarterly or what you do when you do your annual or quarterly business reviews and somebody stands in front of the room giving the same pardon me bullshit forecast they gave last quarter that they missed yeah. they missed the last four and you're not going this is interesting bill and everyone in the room who who in a minute will be at the coffee table over the urinal laughing at it and you're just nodding your head you are perpetuating injustice for all the people in that room who intend to meet their goals, you're, you're letting somebody off the hook here. Your silence is, is condoning gaming the system. Mm -hmm. um, if you know that there are people of color, um, people of underrepresented demographics who feel that they get treated differently than the people who are well represented in your company and you're doing nothing about it to center their voices and center their experience, you're perpetuating injustice. Um, it's not the diversity and inclusion people's job to do that, just in case you wondered. It's yours. Yeah. <laughs> There's, it's great to have cheap EDI officers, et cetera. However, everyone owns this case. Like, come on, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the third pillar, which you and I have talked about a lot off camera, in green rooms, face to face, is purpose. And, um, you know, the concept of purpose in your research, which I, I loved, you actually went so far as suggesting that, well, when purpose is actually activated in actions, not just being words, uh, the organization was three times uh, more likely to have people treat each other fairly, serve the greater good as well. I mean, it's like a one-two punch of awesomeness and you're kind of, to be honest, uh, theory. So how important is purpose then and therefore to the injustice that we see, the concept of dignity that we see, the trustworthiness that we were alluding to, and then just generally the employee experience. 
It's a, it's so, such a powerful question, Dan. You know, we, we don't realize that the promises our organizations make people actually keep score on, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have a mission statement or you, you certainly have value statements, many companies now are now uh, creating purpose statements. Um, but sometimes it's like another layer of wallpaper over eight rails of wallpaper in a, in a house, yeah. right? It's just, you know, pur- it's just purpose washing. Yeah. And the problem is people, you would do better to have nothing and say nothing and just say, we're here to make money, that's it. Then, and be honest about it, than to quit the illusion of purpose. Because what you do is when there is a, a more than one-to-one say-do ratio between those words and the promises that you make and the actions of the organization, um, people keep score. Mm-hmm. And if there's a, if the words elude a sense of, well, those look nice on the lobby wall, but let's, let me tell you how it actually works around here. You've now institutionalized duplicity. You've now formalized the process of saying one thing and doing another. And you've told people that's okay. Around here, your words and actions don't have to match. Mm -hmm. So you've institutionalized it now. Um, So you have to scrutinize those words very um, judiciously. Pull your mission statement, pull your statement, pull whatever promise statements you've made off the wall, put them on your table in front of your team and say, how well are we doing with these words? How well am I doing with these words? When you come to work and you think of these words, do you laugh thinking about me? Or do you, do you see me as someone who sets the example? If somebody followed our team around with a video camera for a day, a day in the life of our team, could that video be used as a training program for these words? Or could it be used as a case study on how not to live these words? Mm-hmm. Ask the hard questions and, and then be quiet and listen to the answers. Because everybody, your, your life as a leader, you're on the Jumbotron 24-7. You have a megaphone strapped to your mouth 24-7. Everything you say and do is amplified. And if you're not scrutinizing how many different versions of you are out there, um, you are just asking for um, your hypocrisy to be put on trial. All of us have say-do gaps. If you're not the one pointing out yours, rest assured somebody else is, and they're not doing it to you. We're all going to slip. We're all going to have goofs. But if you're not the one talking about them and you're leaving it to somebody else, all you do is giving them all the reason to say, why should I try? Mm. And that duplicity can obviously erode confidence, trust, uh, performance, customer set, ESAT, you you name it, right? I mean, it just, uh, it gets out of hand quite quickly. It's a a vacuum cleaner. It just sucks it right out of the organization. (laughs) Um, oh my gosh, I could talk with you for hours, but I got a couple more questions and we'll find out more about you and where we can find out more about To Be Honest and Navalin and Ron Carucci. Um, I'm, I'm entering, well, not entering, I've been entered into this uh, kind of last 12 months of research uh, about the intersection of work and life. And one of the things I've discovered, I suppose, in this pandemic and into a post pandemic era is that, um, you know, we, organizations, leaders are asking of their people to bring their best selves to work. And that has been uh, an adage that Ron, as you know, has been played out for decades. You know, we want our employees to bring their best selves to work. People are our most important asset. Yet what I've discovered is that the, the life that we, we lead and live, yes, it incorporates work, but there are characteristics and things that we need to bring and develop from life into work i.e. there's no such thing as work-life balance. It's really about the integration, right, of how and what we do at work and how we bring that home and what we do at home to bring into work. So there are, I would believe, Ron, characteristics or traits that the organization has to really help the employee develop that just makes them a better human being at work and life. So that's my thesis. I'm curious what you think and if there are some things that organizations should be doing to help the life quotient, if you will, just those traits and characteristics of people in general. Um, first of all, I'm just excited about you doing this research at all, because I think the world needs a Dan Pontifact take on it. <laughs> and so I'm be very excited to see what you do with it and how you help us, you know, get better at this. Thank you. Um, I agree that integration is the goal. I mean, if you've not read um, David White's book, The Three Marriages, it's, you know, it's a stunning example of our marriage to ourself, our spouses and our work. And it was always a tightrope to walk there. It's always a razor thin line and it's a, tight, it's a tightrope without a net. Um, I think, you know, teaching people to, about the relationship to themselves first and foremost, which we, we've not been good at. 
Mm. And I think most of us don't know ourselves well. We don't know our own story. We're carrying around trauma and injuries and biases and aspirations and hopes all packed away in a bag that we've never paid attention to. Um, we have confused and misguided notions of the world and ourselves in it. Um, I loved one of your posts talked about we're entering the age of agency. Um, and I think we, we don't understand how to steward our own agency. We don't understand um, ourselves as agents of goodness in the world. Um, in fact, I think the world has taught us to abandon our agency and mm -hmm. put it down. Uh, and I think agency and power are not necessarily the same thing, although I think a lot of authors out there confuse the two. But I do think that in our, in our last research, you know, at the ten, our tenure study, showed that the greatest abuse of power is not for self-service or self-interest or Im immoral gain. The greatest abuse of power in the world is the abandonment of it. Mm. It's, the, it's our, our setting it aside for fear of judgment, failure, all kinds of things. And so if we want a world that has people inclined to abuse their power doing it less, more of us have to pick up ours and use it for good. And most of us either start with a belief that we can't or shouldn't or don't, don't have anything to offer um, or have been told to put it down and keep our mouths shut. Um, we overcompensate for that by beating our chest and sounding obnoxiously loud and showing up, donning a posture of a big middle finger um, as though that were helpful. And so I think most of us don't know how to steward our voices uh, and steward the fingerprint we want to have on the world. So we all tell people, have a sense of purpose, have meaning in your life. But I think most of us are probably wondering, what the hell is that? And what would mine be? Um, but it's not a big secret why, you know, yours and our peer group, our white male middle-aged peer group, it has the highest rate of depression and suicide in the world right now. Because they got on a conveyor belt 30 years ago, woke up one morning and realized, was that it? Mm. Well, I, I think it, it's, you know, you, that's too, a little bit too late. It's not, never too late, but I think we, could, we should start much earlier on the other end of the people's life cycle to say, do you know why you're here? Do you have a sense for what gets you up in the morning and what makes your heart beat faster and what your story was meant to be for? Um, and if not, help people figure that out. Um, and then go do that and then figure out how to unleash people in your organization to do that within the context of what you need them to deliver. That would be the greatest contribution I think companies could make is to start by seeing people as whole human beings, not, um, not assets. People are our greatest human beings. They shouldn't be our greatest assets. They're not commodities. Um, and most companies hear that expression and see no evidence of it anyway. So it's, people just roll their eyes when they hear it. Um, so I, I think if we could start by acknowledging that being good humans is a skill set, and it's a it's a set of devices we have to learn and a set of mechanisms we're often not taught in how we're raised or taught in an incomplete way. Um, and starting with the compassion to say we're all flawed human beings. Some of us are scarred more than others. Uh, and how do we embrace all of that mess and make our organizations places of redemption mm. to take that humanity and put it into practice in ways that uh, people otherwise would never imagine doing. A couple of years ago, uh, HBR coined uh, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, Captain Empathy. And I'd like to coin you Captain Humanity, Ron Carucci. Uh, you're a management mensch and a gem to this world. We need more of you. Where can we, where can we find more of Ron, Navalent, and to be honest? Thanks, Dan. Well, it's, it's a mutual love fest between us, so <laughs> back at you. Uh, so come visit us at, at our, if you want to come learn about our work in our firm, Navalent, N-A-V-A-L-E-N-T.com. You can find some, a bunch of free eBooks there on how we do our work. So some great videos, some wonderful white papers. We have a regular blog and newsletter. You can put us in your inbox once a month and get our, our wisdom and our take on things around leadership and teams and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, if you want to learn more about, to be honest, um, one of the things that uh, is exciting that we did so to be honest, is a book of heroes. I didn't want to write about the villains. I, we don't need to hear about the runners anymore. We're kind of done with that. Yeah. But I wanted to know about the people who are living lives, leading, organization, leading organizations in ways we want to emulate. People we'd love to have as our bosses. Sadi Nadell is one of the stories in, our, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so we did a video series. So I videoed all the interviews that we did because I knew I wouldn't be able to use all the material. We created a TV series. And so it was a 15 episode TV series called uh, Moments of Truth where you can meet all the incredible heroes that I got to meet 
in the book, or at least many of them. And you can find that TV series at tobehonest.net. You'll find a, a webinar on the book. You'll find the research. You'll find a bunch of articles on the book. You'll also find a free assessment called How Honest Is My Team? Uh, you can sort of get a get a, a little bit of a sobering look at the skinny on whether you're getting the full skinny or not from your team. And um, please follow me on Twitter or follow me on LinkedIn and uh, stay in touch. Well, I always love staying in touch with you. The book, everyone, to be honest, Lead with power of truth, justice, and purpose. Ron Carucci, thank you for this today. Uh, love seeing you. Love hearing from you. I can't wait for the next one. And uh, I hope we clink a glass someday soon again, my friend. Cheers, my friend. <laughs>